Hey folks, welcome back to the Keep It Wasson podcast. I'm your host, BC. And uh, go ahead and uh, if you love this channel, go ahead and hit the like and subscribe button. Both of those help us out a lot. Don't have to smash it. You can just press it gently. We're fine with that. And uh, big shout out to my sponsor, Scani's uh, Ale House and Eatery. Love those guys. Just had a just had a elk burger last week. Very tasty. And a uh, big shout out to Patrick uh, Campbell Haynes <laughs> Menswear. It's run by Patrick Campbell. Very cool people. Uh, up your style with them. So today on the podcast, I have Melissa Ray Hartle, and we're going to talk about we're going to talk about fitness in the new year because that's that's the thing that comes up a lot, and I'm sure she'll have uh, plenty of great stories, won't you, Melissa? She is Absolutely. the she is the uh, wait. Mem- what member did you say? experience manager. <laughs> member experience manager. I'm really struggling with that today. <laughs> and she also happens to be the lead vocalist of the Heartless. Which is pretty yes. cool, pretty cool rock and band uh, from the Lhasa area. And uh, so everything I see on social media is usually from either fitness or it's uh, or it's the band. So that's pretty cool. Yes, absolutely. <laughs> So I guess to start off with, now you are, you're pretty heavy into the weightlifting side of things. And is that correct Very to much. say? Yeah. How did yes. you, uh, how did you get into weightlifting? Cause I know a lot of women, I think a lot of women, and I think that's changing, which is cool, but I think yeah. initially like a lot of women sort of had this, um, you know, like fear of getting too bulky. Um, yeah. I think, I, I think a lot of that's going out, uh, kind of going out the window, which is a great thing, but you know, how did you get into, how long ago did you get into weightlifting and how, how did you get into it? Sure. You know, honestly, um, it's, it's, everyone has a story of course, and it's, it's kind of pertinent to, pertinent to a lot of people and where they're at right now, maybe, um, mm-hmm. new year's resolutions and things like that, because I was where they are. Um, I used to be 30 pounds heavier myself. I was mm-hmm. a vocal performance major and I had nice. the worst case of acid reflux that my doctors had ever seen in someone 18 years old. Um, yeah. And so eventually after being on the third medication, I was being prescribed a fourth because the third had, the three had lost their efficacy. Mm-hmm. Um, so I had asked my doctor what I could do, if, if anything, myself to be able to not have to go on that fourth medication. And he just said, you know, if you eat a little better and move a little more, it'll, you know, you'll lose weight and it'll take pressure off your visceral organs, which should help that acid reflux. Yeah. You know, I had, we, we share that in common. I had a really bad acid reflux when I was a teenager. It's terrible. My yeah. speech pathologist that I saw, she stuck a camera down the back of my throat and she said, you have what I call the cobblestone effect. And yeah, it was that bad. Wow. <laughs> um, so as you can imagine, as a vocalist, that was very detrimental. I ended up getting my my degree in vocal performance, but then after mm-hmm. that, I took a year off, and that was about eleven years ago now. Wow. I took a year off, lost weight, um, got off every single medication, including Tums, uh, within six months or so. But I didn't know how to do anything. I, I mainly focused on my eating habits. Yeah. And then I would go into the gym and I'd sit on the elliptical and I'd like people watch. And this was at my area mm-hmm. high school. And all of a sudden I asked one of the coaches there, I said, can you teach me some of the stuff that you're teaching them? Because I don't know what I'm doing, but I know I want to do more than cardio. So you were on and, the elliptical and you were watching some of the people do weightlifting stuff. Yeah. And you said, I want to do that. <laughs> Yes. Yes. Mm-hmm. You know, and I didn't know what I was doing at all and I didn't want to do it wrong. I didn't want to injure myself. Um, so mm-hmm. that's where I started and I fell in love with it so much that I completely diverted from my original path of keeping going with the vocal performance and getting a master's and things to getting a degree in exercise science, completely on pretty much the opposite end of the spectrum. What do you do with that? I'm going to do wow. music therapy while we work out. <laughs> <laughs> nice. You know? Yeah. <laughs> well, so different. these are more, these are more intertwined. You know, I, I thought these would be two separate topics that we talk about, but this sounds like these are more, uh, the music and the fitness side are more entwined than I, than I thought. Yeah. And That's you cool. know, it, it's, it pays to stay in shape because for how much I like to move around on stage and how, how many words I try to pack into our songs, I have yeah. to be in shape. Otherwise I'm going to be huffing and puffing up there and keel yeah. over. <laughs> 
<laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's a very active thing to be the lead singer of a band. I was, you know, I was in bands in high school and in my 20s, and I was not a lead singer, but still pretty, you know, I'd, I'd usually work, get a pretty good workout uh, just being the bass player at the time. Yes. Mm -hmm. People don't think it, but really, like, you're busting your butt up there. Yeah. Yeah. I kind of wish I had had the, uh, I, had, I wish I had my fitness um, goals then that I do now, or like my fitness regimen, because you know, I was on stage so much, I probably would have been a lot more, I would have felt a lot better about it if I'd been in better shape, I think. And it would have been easier. Mm. Yeah. Everything's yeah. easier. Every like, and that's honestly, Brian, why the biggest reason why I changed my course is mm. because I remembered how I felt 30 pounds heavier and how much less energy I had and just how much harder everything was. And it almost was like unlocking the best kept secret to your mood, your sleep, your everything. It impacts everything. Um, and so I wanted to help other people discover that best kept secret, basically. So let's go back. What was it like when you first started lifting weights? Um, and I mean that both in terms of both in terms of being a beginner and also as a woman too. Yeah, yeah, great question. You know. I was like a sponge. I tried to learn as much as I could via reading um, people that I trusted, you know, who had a background in, in fitness, or maybe they were strength and conditioning coaches. I would pick their brains. Um, but yeah, honestly, there were not many women lifting at all. It's yeah. getting better, but there's a huge stigma. And, and I hear it all the time. In fact, <laughs> I have to laugh on the inside every time this happens because mm -hmm. um, I, I've actually had women say to me while they look, I kid you not, look at my arms and they say, I don't want to get bulky. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I'm so like, oh, I've been doing this for 11 years and I'm trying to get there. Trust me. It's not gonna, it's not gonna happen. Yeah. I was going to say like for, <laughs> you know, for everyone, it's pretty hard to get bulky like you have to work really hard and women have yes. to work I think even harder because you don't have the same hormonal mix so exactly yeah. and I I think I'm maybe at an anatomical advantage in that way being that I'm short mm -hmm. I have shorter limbs so my muscles are going to look a little bit bigger than not so long and lean and more built up um so maybe I'm at a depending on which way you look at it anatomical and mechanical advantage or disadvantage Sure. Um, but yeah, it, it doesn't happen overnight. Just like you, no. you don't put weight on overnight. It's not going to come off overnight. You're not going to build muscle overnight. <laughs> you don't eat the dumbbells. You just lift them. <laughs> <laughs> right. Well, I, I was going to talk about that too, because I, I think there's sort of, um, there's sort of like that initial period where you make a lot of gains, like when, you, when you're yeah. brand new to lifting and they talk about this a lot. I don't know if you listen to any lifting, uh, weightlifting podcast. I love Stronger by Science. If I don't know if you've heard that one. I, I have a, I have a good friend who does listen to it though. And it's and fantastic. Those guys are like, I mean, they're, they're nerds. Like they're super into the data and the science. And if you awesome. listen to them, you would think these, they don't sound like people who lift weights, but then I've, I've looked them up on Instagram. And I'm like, oh shit, they lift like heavy weights. Like they're they totally hardcore. Do. But yeah, they, sound, yeah, they yeah. sound like science nerds. And I, I just cool. love the podcast because they're so thorough. They really look at the data and it's just fascinating. But uh, that, so, yeah, so there's like this period where you kind of make gains in the early stages. And then there's sort of a, almost a plateau where gains start slowing down, but they are cumulative. And, you know, did you <laughs> notice that for yourself? And what is your, what has it been like for you? I guess it would be a better way. Yeah, I mean, yeah, you definitely, you know, the, the saying as cheesy as it may be, what doesn't challenge you doesn't change you is absolutely true. Your body's yeah. going to get used to the same types of routines. Um, so you have to keep, you know, keep challenging yourself and working on progressive overload um, over time, you know, really basically confusing your body a little bit, you know, throwing it a little bit of something unexpected and switching up exercises and things like that. Otherwise, yeah, you are, you are going to plateau. And, um, it's a matter of, you know, incorporating dietary changes as well. Cause people who don't, you know, consume enough protein, they're going to be breaking down their muscles while they're working out lifting weights. And if they don't have enough protein to repair those 
micro tears that they've made, they're trying to build on a foundation of sand, basically. Right. You know, nothing is repairing well enough to be able to build upon. Mm -hmm. Yeah, for sure. Protein intake super important. Yes, and good for um, good for weight loss too. It's one of the few things that really contributes to uh, to weight loss that you can eat a lot of. Yes, it mm -hmm. um, helps. You know, it basically um, stokes your metabolic furnace, if you will, mm -hmm. um, and it helps with satiety too. Yeah, you know, be fuller longer. So yeah. It does. Yeah. I'm uh, currently, I'm currently, sometimes I have kind of a laissez-faire diet and then other times, which is generally somewhat healthy. And then lately I've been cutting out some of the simple carbs again. I've found right. that really works for me. It helps me feel more, um, feel more full. And yes. I think the data, I think the data shows that low carb diets tend to have increases in uh, full, feelings of fullness and decreases in feelings of hunger. That's pretty clear mm -hmm. from the uh, um, uh, meta-analyses that have shown, you know, they collect all the research and have shown that otherwise, you know, it does still, it still comes down to calories in calories out, but if you feel full, you're probably going to eat less and it doesn't work yeah. for everybody. Everyone's a little different, but. Yeah. yeah. I, I personally, and it's, it's interesting to see as you eat healthier over time, your palate actually changes things that you used to really like that were, you know, more junk food. You mm -hmm. revisit those. I, oh gosh, I remember <laughs> The, like, for example, the first time I had had a bite of a Big Mac or Taco <laughs> Bell for the first time in years, oh. I, actually, I could not finish either of them. Yeah, I felt so <laughs> sick to my stomach. My, right. my stomach instantly just flipped. It had been years. So I'm like, oh, you know what? It's been a while. No, 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 no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and even sweet things too. It's like, wow, this is so rich or this is so sweet. This is so, you know, it's just, it's an overload. Yeah. 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 No, I know what you mean. Um, in fact, uh, diet, you know, dietary changes are the whole reason that I pretty much erased my acid reflux. Yes. Um, and it was bad. They said I had, there was, said that, I remember the doctor when I was eight, 17, probably telling me that there were three things that can lead to acid reflux and he was pretty sure I had all three of them. And I was like, Oh, that's bad. Oh no. And, you know, one of the first things that made a huge impact was just cutting out soda. And oh, sure. I haven't, you know, I haven't, I might have soda like once a year, but otherwise I haven't really, I haven't, I haven't like actively drank soda for probably 15 years. That's good. And that was a big start. That made a big difference. And then just cutting out some really kind of junk food, you know, I can still have junk food once in a while, but yeah. Not having it all the time. It really makes a huge difference on my diet. Absolutely. My that's what I, that's what, that's what I tell people. Like, you know, if there's a, you know, you're, you're human, you know, and there's all these temptations out there. Um, I kind of advocate for the 90, 10, or, you know, if you're, mm -hmm. if you're really regimented 95, five, you know, balance where 90 or 95% of your foods are, you know, as close to nature as possible, Mm -hmm. um, higher in fiber, you know, protein, yeah. good sources, good sources of fats, but then you have either that five or 10% where sometimes you just need a little bit of a break from, you know, your same old kind of routine. Mm -hmm. We all do. <laughs> yeah, for sure. But, but yeah. And honestly doing that as well mm -hmm. can also help boost your metabolism too. If you're, if you're dieting and in a dieting phase, having a little bit of something to break that up can actually help reboost your metabolism. Um, just be careful because in, in doing that, you're going to realize the next day you're like, Oh, I'm hungrier than normal. <laughs> right. Well, like realize what's going on, ride it out, you know, kind of thing. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> so I guess, I guess to start off with, what are you seeing right now? Um, as, as the membership experience manager, Hey, I remembered it. Um, yeah. as, <laughs> as that person at anytime fitness, like we've got to be right in peak, like new year's of resolution territory, I'd imagine. Right. Yes. I, you know, I, I feel like the new year's resolution thing, it, it comes a lot because you just had the holidays and you have all mm -hmm. those comfort foods and it doesn't yeah. just happen on Thanksgiving or on Christmas day. It's, you know, the leftovers afterwards, and then you start baking the Christmas cookies and they're in the house yep. and it's all around. There's Christmas parties, all the things. Um, and so people need, I feel like people come in because they realize that they need a reset. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's a big reset. Sometimes they don't, you know, it's like, I need to go way back, start from square one, build a good foundation. Um, 
learn how to eat or learn what to eat. There's so much misinformation out there and, yeah. um, you know, buzzwords, you know, just because it says organic on the label doesn't necessarily mean it's great for you. There's yeah. organic Oreos out there. Yeah, like, exactly. <laughs> yeah, you know, <laughs> so there's all those buzzwords um, and fads that are going on. And you gotta, you gotta, honestly, what I advocate for is trying to stay as close to nature as possible. And if you're going to eat mm-hmm. something that's from a box or a bag, looking on the back and really paying attention, sugar has, for, for example, sugar has so many names. Yeah, so even just knowing what a good handful of those names are, but also, you know, looking at that ingredient label and seeing if, you know, how many, how many items are listed in there and how many do I know what I'm actually reading or do I have to Google, you know, um, staying as close to nature as possible is your best bet. Yeah, I agree with that. I think that's generally a good practice. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. So I was going to, one thing that occurs to me, and I've never really been a New Year's resolution person because I like to make slow incremental changes. And sure. so that doesn't really, and I do them, you know, my, my kind of process is like, see a change that I want to make, evaluate it, make sure it's the change I actually want to make and then develop sort of a strategy to, to make that change and then implement it. So that doesn't really fit into the New Year's resolution model, but um, you know, one of the things that I have observed over the years is that people tend to kind of, kind of do a 180, like you were t- sort of talking about, yeah. and uh, you know, go from like never exercising and eating all kinds of junk food to like, I'm gonna eat salads and work out every day. <laughs> and I wonder if you can sort of address that because I think that's sort of a mistaken thinking. What do you think about that? What do you think the idea of making slow changes? Slow changes are king. In fact, um, one thing that I really advocate for is meeting people where they're at because if you present them with basically an overhaul to everything that they're used to, it's going to create overwhelm and they're going to throw up their hands and be like, I'm done. I can't do this. Yeah. You know? um, but like you were talking about cutting out soda, um, I read a study that the average male, if they drink a soda, one soda every day, if they cut that one soda out in 365 mm-hmm. days, they've lost 16 pounds wow. without changing anything else. So yes, small incremental changes are king, you mm-hmm. know, and um, just like I said, like palate changes, things like that over time, if you present people with foods that they've never eaten and they're maybe closer to nature, um, but it's a complete overall, they, their palate may not, they may, they might be like, this is terrible, yeah. <laughs> you know? Yeah. So just incorporating small changes, maybe, you know, if they're not a vegetable eater at all, find a, find mm-hmm. a vegetable that they're willing to try and have them try preparing it three or four different ways, finding the way that they like, and then, okay, now we got that. Now what's a new goal that we can work on another vegetable. Um, maybe it's increasing their water. Um, a huge thing is sleep. Water and sleep are huge. Yeah. Yeah. You know, definitely and are. then as far as the exercise component goes, you see it a lot where yes, people the, the turn of the new year, they're like new year, new me and pardon my French, but they go balls to the walls <laughs> in the gym right away. And mm. And then they're like, oh my gosh, I am so sore. I can't do this. You know, I'm not cut out for this, things like that. It's like, you have to give yourself some grace, ease Mm -hmm. into things, start, you know, don't start doing five by fives, lifting really heavy. Yeah, Yeah. you're going to be sore. (laughs) (laughs) Work it in, like, you know, if you have to work in two sets of 15 reps, you know, of something built from there, go heavier from there, you know, all about that progressive overload. Um, But working it in gradually instead of trying mm-hmm. to go from zero days a week at the gym to say like four or five. Yeah. You know? yeah. Yeah. I think one of the issues is people like to get into kind of an all or nothing mindset. Yes. And I'm not really sure where that comes from, but I don't think it's a good idea. I think it's good to think of, you know, I, I, I've heard, I remember hearing, I was at this, um, this smoothie shop and I heard some gal talking about how she had done like, 29 days straight and uh, working out and then she missed a day. So she was going to do like a double day. 
I'm like, Ooh. yeah, that, that's a recipe for quitting. <laughs> You're yeah. gonna, you know, that's a recipe for just, you know, if you start building this, just so what if you miss a day? Big deal. Go back and do yes. another day. In fact, a rest day is good. I mean, mm-hmm. uh, in, in talking about, you know, overtraining, you know, a lot of times if, if people are doing that, going that style, balls to the walls, 29 days in a row, they're going to be overtraining and the effects of overtraining. Mm-hmm. I mean, it depletes your immune system. Um, you sleep worse. You're, oh my gosh, it, it can go down to like a cellular level, the detrimental effects of overtraining. So yeah, it's all about balance. It is. Sure. it is. And I, I think, um, I think kind of goes back to like you were saying about the 90, 10 principle, you know? Mm-hmm. So let's say, you know, let's say uh, you, you've decided you're going to work out five days a week, you know, just throwing it out there. And so that's like 20 days in a month. And let's say you miss a day. That's still 19 days in a month. Like yeah. that's better than zero days in a month. So, yeah. <laughs> you know, just forget about it. Just keep, <laughs> keep going. Exactly. You know? Don't beat yourself up. Yeah. Mm-hmm. It's okay. I think it's people get, about, we like streaks, you know, and some yeah. reason as a culture, we really like streaks or we like, we like that consistency, but I, I feel like the better way to get to that consistency is to just like get to the point where you really can't, you, you, you would miss it if you didn't do it. Yes. It's almost like you get a gold star if you do all these days, but then right. it gets taken away if you don't, you know, if you miss a day, it gets taken away. It's like, no, no, it's all about it's about a journey and, and there's really no end point, honestly, yeah. there should not be an end point. It's not like a, it's not like a 21 day fix or things like that. It's meant to, you know, getting into the gym and, and learning new things. Um, maybe you're doing like a training program or things like that in that time frame that they're giving you, they're trying to instill good habits so mm-hmm. that either you can continue on with, with training and learning more or you're ready to take the training wheels off. You've developed the habits enough. You're getting in there three times a week or so on your own and, you know, and being able to go off on your own and feel comfortable doing that, you know, building those habits. So, yeah. So let me go back to when you first started, you know, what did that, what did that look like early on? And then how did your body respond early on versus later to weightlifting? Sure. Um, yeah, beginner gains are a thing, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, cause your body's not, your body isn't used to, you know, doing all those squats or bicep curls mm-hmm. or all those things. Um, so it's going to ride the challenge as much as it can. Mm-hmm. Um, and, and, you know, with proper rest and things like that, it will. Um, so yeah, beginner gains are a thing. Um, but you know, over time, just, tweaking your, tweaking your programs. You have to tweak programs, change programs, um, to keep your body changing, you know, in ways that you want it to change. Um, but also so that your body doesn't get complacent and start to, you know, down, downside and and things like that. You know, you can working your muscles, you know, how do I want to say this? Um, if you're not challenging your muscles, they're not going to necessarily atrophy because you're still using them, Mm -hmm. but you're not going to get all the benefits you would get with, if you challenge your body. Yeah, for sure. At what point did you, at what point did you notice a change in your body? At what point did other people start noticing? I would say usually other people notice first because you look, yeah, you look at yourself every day in the mirror Um, you know, things like that. You're used to seeing you, um, other than clothing fit, you know, clothing fit, you might know first, but Mm -hmm. actual other changes, people be like, wow. Like, actually, I think it was maybe four or five weeks and I'll never forget my friend, Sarah hints. She was like, you're looking skinnier. And I'm like, really? (laughs) I'm like, cool. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. Yeah. It's, um, and then I'm like, you know, yeah, my, my pants are getting a little, a little looser. <laughs> yeah. Do you feel like you've gotten to the point where people look at you and see someone who lifts weights? Yes. Yeah. Cause when I, I, met I, you, honestly, I met you, what last, was it? A, oh, it was right before COVID. Yes. Did that thing with Jared. Yes. And I yep. thought, I bet that guy lifts weights. I'm yep. sure of it. <laughs> <laughs> yep. Yep. I, uh, it's kind of funny, like in the grocery store, I'll, I'll have people be like, 
do you lift weights? I'm like, yes, I do. (laughs) 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 Yes, I do. I have a physical job, but yes, I do lift weights. (laughs) Yeah, nobody's asking me that yet, but I'm sure the sure it's coming. (laughs) It will come. It will come in time. Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's a good feeling, you know. You want to be able to you want to be able to you want it to look like the effort that you're putting in is actually showing. You know, it's like, Mm -hmm. yeah, thanks, I do, you know. (laughs) That's really cool. Yeah. That sure helps for being the sure helps for being the lead singer of a band too. Yes. And it's funny, like they say the camera adds 10 pounds. And especially being at a height disparity of five one, I will attest to that. I it's interesting. I'm like, you know, you look at yourself in the mirror standing right right in front of a mirror, and then you look at pictures, and it is almost like it does add. It's it's weird, but they say it does. And I'm like, I I think I can attest to that as well. Um, But yeah, it's people still are like, they're like, look at your triceps. I'm like, thanks. (laughs) (laughs) Nice. Nice. In fact, I just had that from a a photo that I posted on my story. They're like, your triceps look 3d. I'm like, cool. (laughs) (laughs) That's awesome. (laughs) I was like, that's a first actually. I've never heard that before. (laughs) <laughs> so what was your what was your approach to weightlifting early on and then how has that evolved and changed over the years? Well, um so I I did some reading um talked to a strength and conditioning coach about how to create a program um mm-hmm. but I didn't have a lot of direction at first so I got a lot of you know workout programs from you know like fitness rx or muscle and fitness hers kind of kind of things or bodybuilding.com yeah. Um, and what kind of stuff were you doing? Um, and what kind of reps and, and sets I, and I such? have to say, I love, love, love four by eights, four sets four of eights. eight. Nice. I love, I love four by eights. They're like mm-hmm. four by eights, five by fives. Those are my favorites because I love lifting heavy. Um, I was doing four this, by eights today. It's nice. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I love them. Um, there's this saying that says, there is no point in lifting weights lighter than your purse because yeah, your body's, your body's used to all that, you know? <laughs> no. um, One of the comedians yeah. I follow, like was talking about how he has these like two pound dumbbells and he's like, what do I got to make them pink for? I'm like, I'm like, well, cause they're two pounds, dude. <laughs> yes, exactly. Anyone, anyone could do that. Yeah. Like you can do um, more than that. Come on. <laughs> yes. No, I, uh, I, I don't know. I've, I've learned to love, I, the one place that like failure is absolutely encouraged without a doubt is in a gym. And I've learned to love failure. Um, I've learned to be like, like in the morning, my coworker and I work out together at the same time. And I'm like, Erica, I'm going to need help on this one. Can you got, can you give me like, and, and she's, she's there, you know, it's, it's cool. Um, but yeah, I, I like lifting heavy, like those four by eights, five by fives, things like that. I used to power lift like way back in the day. Um, got in a car accident, got injured. Oh. Yeah. It, it led to, I actually have a bulge disc in my neck and then I broke my tailbone. I was a figure skater for 12 and a half years growing up. Really? And I, yeah, I broke my tailbone across the widest point. Um, so people with sciatic issues out there, I know how you feel. Um, I got to learn certain exercises that if I do not do them on leg day, I will have sciatic pain the next day because things, just, yeah, muscles get tight, things pull. Yeah, a lot of foam rolling, a lot of stretching, hydro massage, all the things. So you had you had a you had an interesting background then. Like uh, I found that figure skaters tend to build up very strong legs to start yeah. with. Yeah, yep. I, uh, one of my ex girlfriends from, gosh, probably fifteen years ago had been a figure skater, and she had she had some pretty nice legs. I'll say. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I'll never forget. Um, a guy from my hometown <laughs> before, I mean, this was when I was in high school yet. He's like, mm-hmm. you got thunder thighs. I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I'm, like well, <laughs> I'm like, I'm like, yep, I totally, totally do. But it's from, um, uh, people are like, were you in gymnastics? I'm like, no figure skating. They're like, Oh, that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yep. Well, that's interesting too. Cause those, uh, like those gymnastic dudes are pretty jacked too. Yeah. And, they oh, do, yeah. and that's not, that's from their gymnastics. I, I think that's pretty interesting. Yep. I was in gymnastics for a while. Um, there's, there's the one caveat of being in these winter sports is Mm -hmm. where do you allocate your time? What what does your heart tell you? Um, and as much as I loved gymnastics, I was, 
um, I was basically senior coach of the senior synchro team, synchronized skating team. And then I did private lessons and all those things in Badger State. And I'm like, my heart's there. So it just, it pulled me back. Oh, nice. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I did speed skating for a little while. That was a lot of fun. Oh, really? Yeah. I'm, I'm afraid to go like super, super fast. Yeah. Because it, 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 gets, it gets, it gets a little hairy when you start learning to take corners fast and you really got to lean. And if you don't lean, you kind of go sliding. So oh, you have God. to learn to lead at the right spot, but yes. it was, it was pretty, it was pretty fun. It felt like, it felt like sort of a, a good extension of like weightlifting and stuff. Cause you're basically using your power and putting it into yeah. using your power to go fast. It's Legs, really interesting. Yeah. 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 Very cool. That's yeah, something that's... that I, I mean, I I've seen someone, I've seen someone take a digger into the, into the boards when they were speed skating. So I'm like, Ooh, don't want to do that. I'm like, I'm, I'm too afraid. I'm too chicken. <laughs> yeah. I felt once. And you know, it's funny. I thought I was going, I felt like I was going really fast, but I, like, I didn't even slide to the boards when I slid. I know when I slid. Really? Yeah. And I was, I was in martial arts for a long time. So I know how to fall really well. Sure. So, like, I, so I wasn't hurt at all. Like they were all, they, it's funny. They all came up and were like, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, <laughs> like I'm fine. <laughs> I'm like, oh yeah, that's yeah, was... fine. Like it was actually like a really good fall, but I've fallen in the winter, like running and stuff. And I'll just go, I had one where my legs just went straight out in front of me and I fell back and landed into a way more perfect break fall than I ever did in any of my classes. And wow. like, I just kind of got up and brushed off and went, you know, it, it kind of sucked, but it wasn't like, it didn't hurt it. It didn't hurt anything. And you then know, I just kept it's, running. <laughs> it's kind of funny. Um, and this, this does actually segue kind of back into weightlifting. Mm -hmm. um, I also, I was always called the graceful faller. Um, and it was really funny because I was like, gosh, for how many times I've fallen on my butt, I'm really surprised I haven't broken my tailbone. Come to find out there was a period of time where I'm like, wow, I feel like I need one of those donut pillows, but I didn't go in because you fall on your butt a lot. It hurts, you know, whatever. Yeah. And I found out I did break my tailbone, but um, wow. so I didn't, I didn't know until I went to a chiropractor and they did an x-ray and they're like, look at that white line right there. Um, no, but I always fell pretty gracefully, kind of like slow, almost slow motion, kind of cushioned my landing kind of thing um, until one time I didn't. Mm -hmm. And I was in private lessons and I, I was doing, um, what was it? A double axle. And I had done it eight times in a row. And my coach, I felt so bad because I feel like she felt responsible, which it totally was my form, my responsibility, but she's like, do it one more time, try to get a little bit more height. And I'm going to pass you out of this level. Um, and so I'm like, all right, I got this. I can do it. I just landed it eight times. Just need to get a little more height. Well, it's all about posture. When you land, you know, arms out, head high, upright mm -hmm. posture, chest out, um, shoulders back. Well, I was really trying to focus on that height and I like, you know, I really dug in and got up there and I happened to be still kind of looking down when I landed, had my arms out and everything, but I still looked down a little bit. It threw me off kilter just enough that, well, basically my right foot went out and so did my knee. Ooh. I broke, yeah, I broke my fibula. Um, nice. and it was so loud during the private lessons. There was me, my coach, another girl getting lessons and her coach out on the ice. That was it. No music, no nothing. And the head coach who was, if you know how the ice rink is set up, there's, you know, the red dot in the center and then the two blue dots, mm -hmm. we were on opposite end blue dots of the rink. Oh, and yeah. she came around in time to see me hit the ground because she heard my bone break. Oh. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. And what was crazy about that, it was late on a Wednesday night. Uh, there wasn't really anyone in the ER and, um, the person, the doctor who did my cast, he explained to me, he said, we're not going to set your bone. It's just going to bridge over. And that area there is actually going to become stronger. So everything's going to be good. Well, long story short, the long-term effect of not setting my bone gave me knee issues mm. and my freshman year of college. Um, I was like, this is getting bad. And they, I, I went in and they basically asked me not in these words, but when's a convenient time for us to go in and break that bone and set it? And I'm like, it's winter time. I'm in college. I'm on the dance team. There is, and I, and I DJ three nights a week. I'm like, there's no good time for me to have a broken leg. I'm like at all. Um, so I'm like, that's not happening. 
But Brian, actually, unbeknownst to me, you know, I, I dealt with it for a while, but when I started lifting weights and strengthening my quads and things like that, which I wish I would have researched way back when, before I had ever started, it actually helped my knee to the point where I don't have any knee pain anymore, unless I sit, you know, like with my knees together, like feet out to the side kind of thing for a while. I don't have any knee pain anymore. Wow. It's awesome. That's, yeah. That is awesome. Weightlifting yeah. saved me from having to re-break my leg. <laughs> well, see, I don't have that problem because I always land my triple lutzes. So, there you go. You know, just yeah, smooth and graceful every time. <laughs> <laughs> teach me your ways <laughs> but, yeah no actually uh, that that uh, ex-girlfriend I mentioned was always pretty impressed that I could skate backwards apparently cool yeah could skate with couldn't skate back, backwards but actually I really like skating so that's why I really took yeah. to um I really took to speed skating very cool. this is a little bit a, a little bit more expensive than I thought it should be for what you like he's really only got it like one hour a week and then it was kind of cut short besides that and I was like well Oh, you know, I think they might have changed it now. So I don't know. We'll see. But but yeah, skates and all that. They're they're expensive. All that stuff. Hockey. Yeah. Gosh, if you want to get into hockey, talk about yeah. an expensive sport. I know. Ooh. I always wanted but, to play hockey when I was a kid. But my parents were like, yeah, I don't think so. Find, yeah. find a less expensive thing to do. <laughs> I see. And I, I, mean, can't, I can't blame them, I guess. <laughs> Yeah, but I mean, you think of, you know, you think of skates, um, and then if you're going to be in shows, there's all these, there's special tights called Mondors, um, and you have your special Mondors, they're very, very thick, and they actually have little, they're, they're, they're tights, but they have an opening on the bottom, and then there's Velcro that you actually hook under your skates, so they, oh. they come together and then meet in the center. Um, yeah, those are called Mondors. So there's, you know, special tights, there's leotards, there's all the show makeup and registering for badger state, all the things. It's It gets expensive too. Yeah, a lot of those sports too. Private that's coaches. Why I, that's why I like weightlifting. It's not that expensive really. I mean, either no. a gym membership or like for me, I just built up, I have a squat rack in my basement and there you go. Works for a bench, so I do. I do it all. I have an Olympic barbell set in my basement, and I do. I do all my work there. That's awesome. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really. Like you can. Yeah, you can invest in a home gym, things like that, or gym memberships. You know, if you need guided direction for a little bit, mm -hmm. personal training for a little while. Um, but it's it keeps you young. It's worth it. It's it's it investing does. yourself. You know. Yeah, you know. Peers. The two things that I've seen that seem to really help people defy aging is weightlifting and yoga. Like those yeah. are the two realms where I remember um, I walked into uh, a gym that, that I was interviewing and this guy, this guy I was interviewing, who was actually, I think he was in his seventies too. And he looked pretty, pretty fit. He probably looked like he was in his forties, but he was training this gal. And I remember thinking she must've been in her late thirties. She was like in her sixties. Wow. I couldn't believe how good she looked in her 60s. Yeah. And the other the other place I've encountered that is in yoga classes. Like I'm just surprised at some of the older women that still look just unbelievably good and young. Um, yes. Doing it. Like like, it seems to be the it seems to be the two things. And I, I do both of them. I do I do a little bit of yoga every morning, helps me stretch out and get ready for the day, usually while my coffee is steeping. Yeah. And uh, so that's been part of my routine for for a little while too. I think it's, you know, because there's a few factors that go into it, but ultimately, primarily, I think it's stress reduction. Yeah, that's possible. You know, cortisol, mm -hmm. cortisol levels in the body. If you have elevated levels of cortisol, it can have, again, detrimental effects down to the cellular level. Yeah. You know, you want to stave off the crow's feet. You want to, you know, stave off all the, all those kind of age related things, get in the gym, find a way, whatever modality of exercise you enjoy the most go do mm -hmm. it consistently yeah yeah the one the one bummer um you know about having a home gym or the one downside is that like i can't really i have to be kind of careful about how close i go to failure because it can be kind of dangerous if you're by yourself uh <laughs> yes yeah, so especially with the spot. bench you know i'm like really conscious i actually i don't use the clamps when i do bench because if i do have to bail i can yeah pop them off yeah. exactly yeah um but have fortunately haven't had to do that yet because i probably will crack my basement floor if i do but <laughs> probably better to do the floor than myself so yes i had to do that one time only one time and it's a scary thing where you're yeah. like got this and you're all of a sudden you're like 
Uh-oh. Oh my gosh, I, I don't have this. I it's do not have this. Back down. <laughs> oh, no. Yep. <laughs> <laughs> Only but one time. I've been reading a lot of the research on like, you know, I think I think there's a certain range between you know, not failure and failure where a certain rep range where you're really, that's where like a lot of the, like a lot of the gains are like in that, in those couple, two, three, two to four reps, like before failure. So you don't necessarily have to go to failure to get that, but you do have to get pretty close. You generally have to get pretty close to really start getting the the gains. Yeah. Like in the last, those reps are like your, your real working reps. Mm -hmm. I say like the ones where they're challenging, but they're not impossible challenging, but not to the point where you are sacrificing your form. Mm -hmm. You know, that's, what's important because as soon as you sacrifice your form, here comes the variable of injury, you know, possible injury, you know? Um, so yeah, I, you know, depending on the rep range, um, you want the last, you know, the last chunk of them three or four, or, you know, depending on your rep range to be, challenging and difficult but not impossible and not sacrificing form yeah i wanted to ask you how do you how do you manage your progressive overload like for me i tend to like lower i've been doing especially lately i've been doing uh d loads where i kind of go back to a lower rep range and then i up the weights but i'm on a lower (laughs) rep range and then i slowly build it back up what do you how do you handle it um as far as d load goes um Typically what I do is maybe just a week of higher reps as much as I hate it, (laughs) Um, easier on your body. Like it's, Mm -hmm. it's the easiest way to basically change up your program without really making a huge change in your programming. Um, Just do, yeah, like lighter weights, a little bit higher repetitions. Um, And even for me, I've learned, I love four by eight so much. I count in fours when I lift oh, nice. and, <laughs> and, and it's like, even though I go one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, my mind knows, Oh, there's the eight. And then I'm going into like 12 and 15. And it's like, my body really loves stopping at eight. So I really mm-hmm. have to push. So yeah, even though you're lightening up your weights, um, doing your higher repetitions with those weights, it's still, you're still working the muscles, but you're not taxing them as much. And it's, it's almost like a mind game. You're like, I'm not done yet. <laughs> Even though this mm-hmm. is boring, it's not as fun, you know? Yeah. But that's how mm-hmm. I typically do deload. But otherwise, how are you progressing? Like, what does that look like for you? Um, like on a, like on a program to program basis or. Yeah. I don't know. Let's just say you're doing squats. Like, you know, what is one week do you do for four by eight for a certain weight and do you just add weight the next week or how are you, are you adding reps and then kind of backing off and adding more weight or how are you more? Um, so like undulating periodization where you're manipulating your number of sets and reps. Gotcha. So, so maybe it's like, you know, your deload, you have three by 15 and then maybe you go to like a three by 10, four by eight, five by five kind of thing. I don't lift heavy, heavy, like Mm -hmm. one rep, two rep, three rep max kind of thing anymore. Um, but yeah, five by fives. I love my five by five. (laughs) (laughs) I've been doing, I've been doing that every two months or so where I do, I'll do first, I'll do, uh, like kind of a max test where I'll just, I'll just start progressing. I'll do like sets of two, but then like progress up to see how high I can get it before it gets to scary range. Gotcha. Yeah. And then I kind of deload the next week and start my progression over again. And so I've been doing like two months. It seems to work for me. I have to look into, I've been hearing people talk about undulating, uh, whatever you said. I've heard that. (laughs) Yep. Yep. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So shifting gears, like how long have you been in the, in the band? In the band? Um, that was January of 2018, actually New Year's mm-hmm. Eve, 2017. Uh-huh. Yeah. So at the end of 2017, it was really neat. My mom, my mom goes, can you please, when you go to karaoke, post a video? Cause I haven't heard you sing in so long. So I did. Mm-hmm. And I think it was a a September of 17 and my now drummer and um, actually a band called the mad, mad ones, their former lead singer, Mm -hmm. they both saw that video and they must've kind of gotten together and talked because they both messaged me. 
Nice. And yeah, they both messaged me and they're like, Hey, we saw your video. Just wondering if you want to come jam sometime. And I'm like, uh, yeah, <laughs> yeah. And like, that sounds awesome. <laughs> um, and so like, cool. They're like, well, here's our, you know, our, our albums on Spotify. Um, Ted sent me their lyrics and it just kind of, you know, plugged away at homework, so to speak, um, you know, going over the songs and things like that. And then I came and jammed with them and <laughs> this could get long. <laughs> <laughs> um, I was steered away from the band for a little while, which ended up turning into a song, which is kind of fun. But um, at that, that first jam, basically, they're like, you know, we didn't want to put the pressure on you, but we're kind of looking for a new lead. And mm -hmm. so this was kind of an audition. And if you want the spot, it's definitely yours. And I'm like, this is freaking awesome. Nice. Um, well, things had changed. I know, um, to my understanding, Ted got promoted in his, um, at his line of work. And so mm -hmm. the scheduling just wasn't quite working out, yeah. you know, the way that, you know, conducive for practicing and things like that. Right. So what had happened in that time, mm -hmm. I had been pulled away. I, I basically was, was told by I was kind of brainwashed saying like, why do you want to be in a band? And da, 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 da. Um, discouraged from being in a band um That's but then good. yeah yeah I was brainwashed definitely um <laughs> but it was kind of neat because on New Year's Eve I had the decision to make of do I go to New Year's Eve with this person and hang out at this swanky resort and all the things just with that person or mm -hmm. do I go hang out with my girlfriends and then go see this kick-ass band at the speakeasy do the band do the band <laughs> do the band i totally did the band I was like, you know what guy you can go do your own thing i'm gonna go do this and that night they were playing at the speakeasy as herb and the flying sandersons oh interesting yeah and it's it's another like plan words with names thing it's pretty cool um but they saw me there they're like hey do you want to come up and do a couple songs and I was like, oh, my God, it's been like two months, maybe I'm like or a month, uh, about two months. And I'm like, sure. So here's me. Literally, I pull out my phone with the lyrics that I had emailed, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> <laughs> trying to be as discreet as possible. I'm like singing like this, you know, <laughs> um, with my phone back towards Nick on the drums. And um, at the end of that night, they, you know, Jeff came up to me and he's like, you know, we still haven't found quite the right fit you know for a singer and so if mm. you're still interested it is the spot's yours nice um and I'm like you know what yes like I I regretted stepping away so I'm like yes if I have the chance again 100 percent so and had you ever been in a band before I had been in I had been in a jam band a while back mm -hmm. um two technically one in one in high school and then one out of high school and gotcha. then um, I wanted to be in one in Appleton um, and, and I, we started off and we, um, I ended up moving across the country. Oh. And so, yeah, we played one show and it was for just like a bunch of close friends and family and stuff like that. It was super mm -hmm. fun. Um, now they are um, actually someone from my hometown. Her name is Mercedes Vaughn. She is actually their lead singer. They're called Baggage on the Runway. Super awesome oh, nice. people. All of them are just awesome, awesome people. So if you've ever heard of them, um, you know, go, if you haven't heard of them, check them out. Go check out a show. They're super nice people. Super fun. Very funny. That's cool. Yeah. Um, but this Those... was really the first, the first like actual, like setting up shows and going out and doing mm -hmm. stuff. Yeah. Yeah. Is this, is this the typical kind of music that you like? Yes. Yeah. In fact, um, I was raised on, I was raised on like softer rock, um, more like Def Leppard, Journey, um, Toto, Chicago, all those kinds of things. Nice. My mom, my mom likes a little bit heavier stuff. Um, in fact, I, when I lived I, down in Texas. I was <laughs> super surprised when I interviewed Marty Shaka and he said that Toto was his favorite band. Yeah. Journey's that blew me, my that blew me away. I'm like, Toto, yeah. really? I'm like, I was like, well, I love Africa. I'm like, there was you know and i looked at the music you know they have like some really good uh like actually africa is a really complex chord yes. progression yes yeah no kidding Which, you know today oh. today if you go through the top five it's all one four five six it's like yeah with some yep. exceptions in all fairness but yeah it's kind of interesting because like my my guilty pleasure is journey just because 
I grew up mm-hmm. on that. And Steve Perry, I, I'd actually probably say I have a decent amount of vocal influence from Steve Perry, um, mm-hmm. Aretha Franklin, Alicia Keys kind of thing. Um, being that I was classically trained, I really like, um, you know, more of like, I, I grew up on a lot of the clean vocals, whereas now over time I've delved 10 years ago, if you would have introduced me to the bands I listen to now, I'd have been like, whoa, <laughs> it's almost like, it's almost like becoming desensitized over time when you're, if, so to speak, expanding your palate, mm-hmm. your ear palate, if you will, um, to be able to consider, I like, I, I like calling it considering new music, um, where you like really mm-hmm. sit there and you find things that you appreciate about it. Even if it's not really your thing, you're yeah. like, you know what? I can, I can really appreciate his vocal range or wow, they mm-hmm. do that really well. Wow, that's technical guitar playing, things like that. Yeah. Um, if you would have <laughs> if you would have introduced me 10 years ago to what I listen to now, I'd have been like, <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> yeah, one of the things that I've learned to appreciate in the last few years that I, I really didn't get, like even when I was in my 20s and in bands and stuff is uh, like the value of production. like like how much production goes into a record and how much mm-hmm. the producer influences that and matters or some of the bands that are really good at the production side themselves. Yeah. I, you know, I used to not really understand that, that role. And I just thought, well, a producer is just a guy who, I don't know, sits behind the, sits behind the controls or something, but you know, now I'm starting to really learn like how much that matters and how much that shapes an album. Yes. You know, and speaking of Marty Cheka, um, mm-hmm you know, locally, I remember, gosh, this was 2019. Um, I was talking to Sandbomb. We had just played in Marshfields out at the, you know, their amphitheater there. And we were talking about The Will, their album that Marty hmm. Chaka did. And, Making and a Sandbaum, very happy music. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And honestly, it's pretty cool. Like four of their songs, I think, are on my, like, on repeat on Spotify. Um, but yeah, I remember can we talk about how much stuff Eric Thomas does. Jesus. Yeah. Right. No He's kidding. got like four businesses yeah. and Oh, by the way, I have a band and we have an album. Yeah. <laughs> I keep, you know, every once in a while I bug him. I'm like, man, I'm like, when are you going to do a show again? Cause I yeah. happened to miss that big one, um, that they did. And I'm like, God, man, you guys are so good. And, you know, I was saying like, I was talking to Sandbomb that night after we had both listened to the album and we both had like goosebumps. We're like, this is incredible. And I just sat there thinking like, if Marty can do half of what they did on the Will album, like, oh my God, it's, it's incredible. Well, you know, and, it, the, and the Mad Mad Ones album too. Yeah. It's yeah. Really, oh it's really something. Yes. Mm-hmm. It's like, you know, maybe that m- might not be everyone's, you know, cup of tea for music, but gosh if you just you know throw in your headphones a good pair of headphones and you really sit there and listen to all the different parts it's like it's incredible it's incredible stuff and so yeah I even I think I I think I reached out to Eric Thomas once and I'm like dude I'm gonna learn how to scream I'm like (laughs) if if and when that day comes not if when when um, when that day comes I'm like I'd I'd love to open for you guys because they're just solid. I mean, that that guitar solo and suspended terror gets me every time. In fact, I had my on repeat on this morning when I was lifting weights and I just was kind of in the zone, you know, and my music was more background. But mm-hmm. it's funny, actually, that song was on. I was still kind of, you know, in the background, but that freaking guitar solo came on and I like looked at my phone. And I'm like, oh, yeah, that's suspended terror. That's right. Yeah, nice. <laughs> like, it just like grabs you. Yeah, it's. It's cool. They're good. Yeah, I can't. I can't believe Marty Shaka invited me to come jam with them. Y'all yeah, really? That's I'm cool. I'm fucking terrified of that. <laughs> <laughs> he is a virtuoso. Like, yeah, I he got, is. It's I was incredible. Like, and I, he, yeah, I said, I said, yeah. Once COVID's over, man, let's let's do it. But I'm like, I'm more. I, well, I, I'm less. How would I put this? I'm proud enough about my songwriting ability that I'm hoping that covers up my lack of uh, guitar skills. Playing ability. <laughs> I mean, I've well, been improved. I've improved a lot since I've really, I've really kind of dove back in once COVID started. I'm at home and I, I bought a new, gu- even a, bought a new guitar and I've been like <laughs> playing all the time. But mostly, I've been focusing on writing and 
I've definitely improved my skills, but compared to someone like Marty, it's like, <laughs> well, Hey man, at least, I mean, I'm pretty sure I have this video on Instagram. Um, I remember back when I was learning how to cord, I was playing a breaking mm -hmm. Benjamin song. I, I forget which one it was, but at least you don't have a video of, you know, you're sitting there cording oh, and yeah. then your cat comes up out of nowhere, literally while you're strumming jumps and hits your hand and like knocks your hand away like basically he was like you're done <laughs> <laughs> i was like what the hell? i was like That's okay so... stop. <laughs> yeah i mean it's the same thing when i go play with harold mello that dude that dude i don't know if you know him at all or have seen him but he had the band he, sub style for a while oh yeah 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 yep. yeah yeah that dude is like an, that guy's a guitar encyclopedia and like really i know that i'm nowhere close to his ability level but i learned so much so I'm, I'm, I'm very i'm very very excited and also terrified to, to hang out with marty and play but yeah. <laughs> you know he's such a nice guy i'm sure it'll be fine oh yeah yeah oh definitely and you know it's just it's it's a new level of appreciation when you when you see someone play that's like 20 whatever levels if you will more experienced than you you're just like Oh my God, that's, that's cool. And it's, it makes you appreciate it all the more. Cause obviously they've put in how many years, you know, and all this yeah. stuff. It's one of those. Yeah. It doesn't happen overnight kind of things. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Where like, where like a guitar is basically an extension of themselves. Like it's, it's pretty cool. It is cool for sure. Yeah. So this is super interesting to me. Like, so you, you were a vocal major, you said. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And um, well, basically I had gotten that degree. I, I wasn't exactly sure what I wanted to do with it. I'm like, you know, part of me would love to teach private lessons. Mm -hmm. um, but my acid reflux was actually affecting me so bad to the point that I had to sleep on a foam wedge at night. Wow. Yeah. Um, like to kind of keep you propped up, do you mean? Yes. So it didn't come up? Yeah. That's... Yeah. Yeah. And, mm -hmm. you know, I had, to, I had to stay away from, I remember, tomatoes i had low yeah. acid orange juice if i had orange juice you know all mm -hmm. those things yeah it was bad yep, i remember that um, but yeah basically took that year off um and the doctor was right even though i because i asked him i'm like okay you tell me eat better and move more but how do i do that and he's like oh you know just eat better and exercise i'm like okay well <laughs> despite <Thanks>. you know <laughs> yeah, no, yeah despite his uh lack of in-depth information that he had to give me he was right because losing oh. the weight did take the pressure off and yeah you know kept me from you know having to be on all those medications with all those side effects like the fourth one that I was prescribed was called Reglin and I remember mm -hmm. that was my last semester in in college actually that I was told to be put on it and the so the, I mean the side effects were not only personality wise polar opposite from me it was like suicidal depression uh or manic depression suicidal thoughts and then there was also falling asleep while driving and i'm like i'm commuting for work and school that's not an option um i basically was like i can't be put on this what can i do or is there anything i can do myself so that i don't have to be on that so it it was pretty cool to you know see um at one point in time you know I was on Prilosec OTC and Zantac 73 those worked for a little bit then we had to add the highest dose of Nexium twice a day wow. then I'll see those yeah I and remember I mean, taking like, I remember taking Prilosec yeah no. and Nexium the highest dose twice a day I want to say back then it was $487 a bottle mm. so two times a day if you didn't have insurance could you imagine like I couldn't imagine that. And suddenly the uh, lifestyle changes just sound like a better bargain, don't they? Oh yeah. The yeah. time effort that it takes to, you know, research and, and do the things that put the effort in, it's totally worth it. For sure. Because of all the, you know, little did I know, I'm like, okay, so I'm just going to lose weight. So it's going to take pressure off my visceral organs. I'm not going to have acid reflux. Little did I know that there's all these other, it's basically like a web of, positive effects that came from it that I wasn't yeah. even expecting. Crazy, know? isn't it? Yeah. It's like I said, the best kept secret is literally paying attention to your health. Mm -hmm. Literally. It definitely is. Yep. Well, I've yeah. often said that Americans, Americans will do anything to get healthy except eat, eat well and exercise. <laughs> yeah. 
what's the quick <laughs> fix, right? It's like, yeah, oh, exactly. there's no quick fix. No, nope, got to do the work, I'm afraid. <laughs> yes. So how much of, uh, let's see, how would I word this? So, so you have this, this this classical training background, this music vocal background, this sort of uh, vocal major style vocal background. How do you translate that into what you do with the Heartless into a heavy um, metal band? So heavy metal, is that a good I very metal? Much I don't know what it is. What do they call I very that much now? appreciate when people call us metal. Um, <laughs> Cause like to me, metals like, you know, Lamb of God and like all the heavy, heavy, like death metal uh, and stuff like that, that I listen to. Um, but yeah, old school metal, we're definitely influenced by old school metal, mm -hmm. huge um, influence. I know uh, Sandbomb is very heavily influenced by Sabbath, mm -hmm. uh, Black Sabbath, um, you know, Good Ozzy. I love Ozzy. I love Ozzy. Um, Is it all the same? It's all. It's pretty much all the Mad Mad One members except the vocals. Would be. Would you say in, 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 the, in the Heartless? Is it all the same members except you, the different you instead of the other um, singer, or is there different all, people? Um, so it is the three. Um, it's you know, Sambom was from the Jeff Sambom was from the Mad Mad Ones on guitar. Ryan Anderson on bass, Nick Brettel on drums. And then I came in January of 18. And then November of 18, we, you know, we had mulled around a little bit at, at band practice, the idea of adding keys. Um, we have these two songs, Crack in the Sky and The Reckoning, that Jeff was like, I could really hear some awesome key parts on that. Nice. So we chatted with Steve Lotharius, who had taken, you know, 12 years of mm -hmm. piano um, growing up and stuff like that. And we started incorporating him in. He actually started a little bit both um, rhythm guitar and keys. Uh, but we're, we, we kind of heard something different. We're like, you know what? Instead of a second guitar, there's a lot of versatility that could be added and, and, and fill, you know, like in mm -hmm. a different kind of way with synth. Oh yeah. 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 So he's keys and synth and it just, oh, it's, it's awesome. I feel like, you know, I feel like as a four piece, mm -hmm. we're, we're, you know, we're solid, but that little extra, it does add just that little extra something that just makes it, you're like, yeah, you know, it's, it's cool. And would you consider adding a kazoo player? <laughs> Cause I play a mean kazoo. Heck yes, man. To join. We'll get you up on stage. <laughs> Hey, I play flute. I'm wondering when we're going to utilize that too. Heck yeah! <laughs> well, one of my one of my teachers in college was in the uh, was in the band Green Tea. And Green he, Tea. Yeah, and he played. It was an Irish band. Oh my god! And they played that. He played flute in the band, and cool. He could do like um, his. I think his parents were both Juilliard trained musicians. Oh he wow! He could play a flute with his hand. I still have no idea. He would go like like this, and somehow it'd be like. <laughs> They make this flute noise. I don't know how the fuck he did it. But it was it was the craziest thing. That is awesome. Yeah, Every time I think about like incorporating flute into our music, I think of um was that Anchorman where Will Ferrell gets up on the tables and he's playing the jazz flute. I can't remember. But I, remember. Just, like, I picture that and I'm like, mm, maybe not. Yeah. <laughs> but Who yeah, knows? I did I, sorry I cut you off when we were talking about vocals, but oh no. Yeah, I was, um, I was curious about how you translate that to oh. what is it basically a metal band or like a heavier band? Yeah, yeah, no, sorry. Um, and my, my thing was, I just, I really appreciate when people call us metal because, yeah. you know, my, my way, I think like heavy, heavy, and, and that's mm -hmm. the music I love. Um, but I, and you might be able to pick this out if you come and watch us. Mm -hmm. One thing that I, I think I use the most, you know, other than like breath support technique and things like that, I am so huge on visualization. And it's funny, I'm hmm. so huge on visualization that I use it in my personal training as well. Interesting. I'll, I'll you know, explain an exercise. Um, and then I'll be like, tell you what, show me what it would look like if you pack two suitcases and you're about to, you know, take off to the airport, bend down as if you have a suitcase on each side of you and show mm -hmm. me what that looks like for, you know, like doing like a double kettlebell deadlift, say for example, or things like that. Um, I've, I've had people just nail it spot on. I'm like, if I would have known here, I'm thinking like, Oh, I need to cue them all these different cues for proper deadlift form. 
Um, I've actually had several people, not, it doesn't happen all the time, but several people just with like a simple, you know, everyday sort of metaphor, if you will. Mm -hmm. I'm like, that actually was perfect. (laughs) So with visualization, um, one technique that we had been taught was landing on top of the note, you know, um, Mm. Karen Giuliano, I took private lessons at the Wausau Conservatory after I graduated. Mm -hmm. And this is going to sound really weird, um, but some vocalists may know what I'm talking about. She actually taught me how to sing out of my eyes. As weird as that sounds, um, we were in- I'm fascinated by all this. Yeah, and I gotta tell you, when she's like, you'll know when you do it right, you'll know. And uh, I remember looking at the brick in our private lesson room and and just watching the lines of the bricks just start to vibrate. And I was like, Mm -hmm. oh my gosh. And I actually had to like hold onto the piano for a second. She's like, you did it, that was right. And I was like, really? Cause you know, sound, sound can, you know, reverberate, you can make it like kind of channel in different ways. Um, I guess that's the best way I could maybe describe it. Um, but basically she taught me a lot about singing, imagining like you're singing out the top of your head, landing on top of a note. So actually you'll, you'll see me do like this a lot. Cause, and, and I'm literally oh. like thinking in my brain, I'm, I'm visualizing doing certain techniques while I'm on stage. So I actually use it, I use it quite a bit actually, or you'll see me go like this um, because instead of thinking like, oh, that note's really high, instead of thinking of high and low notes, I started thinking of it as more of a, a spectrum, a horizontal spectrum of notes, because mm-hmm. when people think to themselves like, oh, that's a really high note, like naturally you're like, oh God, it's really high. And you're like, <laughs> oh, tense up, you know? And it's like, that's the yeah. last thing that you want to do. You don't want to be tense. So instead of thinking of it in a vertical spectrum, thinking of it in more of a horizontal. Mm. And so, yeah, you'll see me do like certain hand gestures. I've seen them caught in photos and I'm like, oh yeah, I was totally doing that (laughs) on top of the note there. I have weird finger posture, like you'll catch it in photos. So if I come to one of your live shows, I'll get a vocal lesson too. (laughs) Yeah. Nice. I'll be talking about something totally different, but I mean. Two for for one, you get. Yes. Yeah, awesome. (laughs) So what do you, uh, you know, what's your guys' approach to the band? Like, what do you see? Is it like friends getting together and having fun? Is it like, we want, really want to take this somewhere something in between? I, I'd have to say, you know, where, where we're at in life. I, I mean, I would love I mean, I think me and Sandbum both have like the same thought process on a lot of things when it comes to mm-hmm. this, um, is like, it would be awesome to tour, um, I'm not sure about our ability to do so. Um, Mm -hmm. just given that, you know, our, our work ventures and things like that aren't always conducive for us to just up and leave for a couple months, you know, think that it would be awesome. It would be so, so awesome. Um, but I mean, for now we're just, you know, staying in, staying in the Wisconsin area kind of thing. Um, we're talking about, getting more so into Minneapolis and things like that. Of course, COVID's been kind of a ache in our side. (laughs) Yeah. For everything. (laughs) With everything, absolutely everything. But yeah, yeah, I mean, I think, I think, you know, we would love to, it's just not always conducive to be able to do so. Mm -hmm. So did the, did the band change a lot from Mad Mad Ones to the Heartless? Uh, are, Are you guys using a lot of the same songs or did you write all new songs or how's that working? Um, to my knowledge, you know, all new songs, um, mm-hmm. I think we've maybe recycled a couple of riffs, maybe in sure. songs and, and kind of made them our own kind of morphed things. But um, I will say, gosh, I, I always have to go back in the archives of my brain um, and really think of this, which song came first, well, either it was Achilles heel or a song that we have called unicorn, which by the way, speaking of guitar technicality and just technique, you know, all the things, Every time Sam Bomb plays that song, my my brain just kind of falls out of my head a little bit. I like yeah. go to a different place. I totally go to a different place. Yeah, he's a stronger um, man. <laughs> I went to, uh, I remember, I think it was 2017, maybe even earlier. It might have been 2016 when I went to one of their practices. I did a story on for City Pages about 
I, I was called making the band and I interviewed a bunch of different bands and like oh, how they handled so the business cool. side of it. And so I came, I needed photos. So I, one of them was, I came to, I came to one of their practices. I think that's how I got to know Nick. No kidding. Yeah. It was pretty oh, cool. It was pretty fun. Oh my gosh. Yeah. It's just, um, but I was going to say, I think, you know, stylistically wise, whichever song came first, Achilles heel or unicorn, mm-hmm. our, I feel like something happened with the creation of that song because all of a sudden our style, I think um, our, our different parts of writing coming together, they gelled in a, in a new and better way. I'm like, you know what guys, I, I feel like our music has taken on a new level, you know, of nice. just in- intricacy, catchiness, you know, um, all of our different backgrounds, as far as influence go, just kind of, melding together better and, and understanding like uh <laughs> the, me, me and Sandbomb were talking and and I'm like I, I actually just uh maybe three weeks ago or so four weeks ago wrote a new one and uh, I'm like guys this one's gonna be heavy and angry and who knows maybe if I can learn to scream there might be parts you know screamed in it and uh I'm like I have an idea kind of a rough idea in my head of what I'm thinking. And Jeff goes, I speak Melissa. And I'm like, yeah, I, do. <laughs> I like <laughs> yeah. that. Yeah. So, um, so it sounds like the process are you're kind of writing, are you writing uh, with guitar all- too or in piano, or are you just writing the words and bringing it and saying, make something out of that? Or how's that working? You know, every song's a little different as far mm-hmm. as, you know, what first component, you know, came to be and then who added after that. Um, for, for a while I was writing to instrumentals, like the road was a song that they had all previously, um, that was the first song I ever wrote to, um, they all had their parts previously written. Um, and then, you know, shed the skin was one, (laughs) the writing with that. I, I thought of, you know, the, the words to it. I thought of the instrumentals, what I wanted it to sound like. I wanted mm-hmm. it to be another one of like those in your face just because of the message kind of thing. And yeah. I told that to the guys and I remember going off. I'm like, I'm going to use a laser. I'll be right back. And I remember coming back and Ryan was playing this bass line that sounded, I, I literally said to him, like, I go, what is that Stevie wonder bullshit that you're playing right now? Cause <laughs> it's totally not. <laughs> and he literally said, he's like, just wait, just wait, just listen, just listen. And then he played it and he's like, okay, now sing. And I was like, you know what? I like that. I, and I ended up liking it more than my original idea. So it, it's just kind of cool, you know, all of us putting our own little spin on, on things because of our influences. Um, yeah, shout out to the bass player, by the way. Bass players don't get enough credit. No. And you there's know, a lot I of songs to- that are like so, the, the bass line is such the driving force on the song. And it maybe. <laughs> I have to say, we have this song called Nihau Bro for whoever comes up to our show because he mm-hmm. blushes and gets all like, don't say it <laughs> every time <laughs> so. But Nihau Bro, like, man, oh man, he's sitting there like da 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 and just like his hands like a blur. Nice. And I just want to be like, um, props to the bass player on this next song, like, because he's just kicking ass. So everybody watch him. He's like, don't do it, don't do it. <laughs> so I'm like, okay, I won't say anything. <laughs> But really, like, yeah, he's he's ridiculous. He used to play um, in a band called Evelocity that you know toured with a lot of bigger bands. He's he's got nice. a heck of a heck of a background. Yeah. Yeah, that's awesome. Play the shit out of that bass. Slap the bass. <laughs> <man>. <laughs> that's how you got to do it. Yes. <laughs> yeah, that's great. Yeah. Yeah. I, well, you know, I, I I'm partial to bass players because I used to be a bass player. That's what I was. All, all through high school and my band and the band I was in, uh, you know, the Allen brothers. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Bob Allen and I were in a band back in uh, when I was in my early twenties. Really? Yep. Oh, that's very mm-hmm. cool. It's kind yeah. of, you know, a small world. It really is like how, and also I would say how connected our local music scene is, mm-hmm. you know, it's, it's really, really cool. It's like, yeah, yeah. I totally know who that is. Yeah. Yeah. It's so, funny. Uh, actually it took a while. Um, in fact, I was telling I was telling Harold about this. Like, it took for a very long time. I thought of myself as a bass player who was playing guitar, and it's really okay. only recently that I've I said, "Dude, you don't play bass anymore. You only play guitar. You're a guitar player." 
There you go. It took a while to make that identity switch, I guess. Sure. Mm-hmm. Was it was it almost like a mentality switch for you, you think? Yeah, it was totally mentality, right? Yeah. Um, cool. Especially, um, especially you know, since COVID hit, like I really started diving into music again, and I had so much time, and so I started learning, you know, really learning the play and really, yes. really steering into it um, in a way I never had before. But now I'm finally writing music that I actually like, and I don't hate. Like two months later, yay! So it's like Is I that- finally hit that hit that spot where it's like, oh, now the good stuff's coming. Yes, and it's kind of funny when, you know, because I've I've always written, I guess poetry. I've always written poetry. Mm-hmm. Um, songwriting was something really kind of new to me. Oh, I got to fit it in, you know, certain cadences. And and as you can tell, I have the gift of gab. So I'm like, <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so I'm, you know, it's like I have a lot to say on these topics that I'm writing songs on. How do I condense it down, but yet still get my message across? Kind of thing. Yeah. Um, and you go back in time and you, you look at your, you know, preliminary writing and I, I kind of, I'm like, every once in a while, I'm like, wow, but (laughs) I'm like, (laughs) you know, like, wow, that's bad. Um, but every once in a while, I think I still have a folder somewhere of stuff I wrote when I was in my twenties. I'm afraid to open it. (laughs) (laughs) You're just like, oh God. Um, (laughs) but you know, then again, every once in a while I go back and I'm like, you know what, that's, that's not bad. I'd maybe rework this a little bit, but it's kind of neat to see. Um, it gives you a different understanding of music. I think mm-hmm. writing over time and just, you know, excelling to learn more about writing and, you know, yeah. like to write better and things like that. Just trying to like up your game. Um, yeah. And I've been like just devouring podcasts about songwriting and about song, like all these, like, I love song exploder when they break down how a song came up, came to be written oh. or like um, broken record is a good one too. Cause it's like producer Rick Rubin talking with all these. Oh, cool. he, had one, he had one with Butch Vig. I was like, Oh, Oh my God. Yeah. Like um, I think the thing that the biggest lesson that I've learned and, and this has to go with my gift of gab, but you know, I remember we did, so the song unicorn actually, mm-hmm. there's this part where I'm like, <laughs> I literally was like, what the hell do I write here? I have no idea what to write here. And then it kind of mm-hmm. dawned on me, less is more sometimes, you know, mm-hmm. and to really let, you know, cause there was this baseline, you know, coming through that I, I guess I'm, I was more inclined to be able to write to guitar over bass for the longest time. So I literally was like, what do I write to? But then it's kind of neat. We have this song called Fortunate One that was actually more Ryan's, our bassist, brainchild. And it kind of forced me to think very differently, being like, how do I write to a bass line? And it's one of, it's one of those, um, the song is about, um, even though I do classify age-wise as a millennial, I don't feel like I fit the mold at all I've been called an old soul a lot and Mm -hmm. I I feel like honestly it's all about the way that you're raised and so props to my parents you know kick-ass parents I'm really thankful for them um but it's for my you know the song is about my strong distaste for that millennial mentality the whole um I want it I want it now and I don't want to work for it I want everything delivered I literally have this one this one line in there that says, um, gosh, it says, uh, living your life from a silver spoon. Did you want me to feed you too? Like, here's your spoon. Do you want me to feed you too? Like, (laughs) (laughs) it's just, it's just this, um, the second verse goes, no one said it would be that way. Easy breezy. Are you a cover girl, baby? This ain't BK. You can't have it your way. Um, and what does it say? This ain't BK. Can't, um, can't have it your way. Um, your duties. Just, just start talking about Burger King, not, not my name, by the way, just to be clear. <laughs> BK. <laughs> <You're> right. <laughs> no, no, no. <laughs> this ain't Burger King. <laughs> you can't have it your way. Um, but yeah, like I just, um, I feel like also over time, it's allowed me to come out of my shell a little bit more with like just being more in your face. I'm, I'm kind of a naturally high strung, intense person. And, um, 
if I feel strongly about something, like I'll definitely tell you about it. And I feel like in the writing process over time, it's allowed me to just be more in your face about it and be like, you know what? Mm -hmm. Kind of unapologetic about it. Nice. Yeah. So speaking of, and this is something I've been asking a lot of singers and I'm always surprised at the response that I get, but when did you get comfortable with your voice? <sighs> um, you know, actually what it was, was there's this thing called adding color to your voice. Hmm. Um, that means basically being heavily influenced by someone's sound to the point where your sound takes on elements of their sound. Interesting. Um, and I would say that um, I would say that Steve Perry was a heavy influence on, on mine, which it just comes naturally. Every once in a while I hear it come through even still. Um, but I think when, when I decided, um, basically I was like, you know what, I'm not going to do that anymore. I'm just going to find my own voice and not be influenced by, you know, because before I was ever in a band, I was, you know, doing cover songs, you know, and so naturally you're like, oh, they sing it like this. And I feel like when the day that I was like, nope, you know what, I'm just, I'm going to find my voice down to the root without any influence, just what my voice is. Um, I had been hiding behind color for so long that I was like, wow, that's what I sound like. And um, I was glad I'm like, Hey, at least I can, you know, I'm in tune, <laughs> you know, nice. um, at first I was like, this is different. You know, it, it's mm -hmm. different adding color to your voice. Um, but I think that's what made me appreciate my own voice all the more because it was kind of empowering to be like, this is me without any influence, you know? Interesting. So, yeah. Yeah. The reason I ask is because I've been so surprised at how many, even professional longtime singers struggled with the sound of their own voice until usually very recently. Um, so I interviewed, uh, I, I interviewed Nika Danilova, who's uh, Zola Jesus. Okay. I don't know if you've heard of her, but she's like kind of an, she's, she's originally from Wausau and then now has moved back to the Wausau area, but she's like toured all over, you know, she's cool. a pretty big singer. She's been, has a bunch of songs and like various soundtracks, like uh, Grey's Anatomy and stuff like that. Wow. And I asked her, like, when did you when did you get comfortable with your own voice? And she's like an opera trance singer. Cool. She does like these really dark, I almost call it pop, but like a really, really dark kind of a pop, almost operatic sort of a pop. It's really interesting. Wow. And uh, I asked her, like, when did you get comfortable with your, your own voice? And she was like, yeah, it's probably like a couple years ago. I'm like, holy shit. Yeah. And then yeah. as I've been diving into more of these podcasts and I hear singers like Jeff Tweedy said the same thing. He's like, like he had a, he had a really hard time liking his own voice. Yeah. Same, same here with, with me, I'd say just a couple years ago, because mm -hmm. before it was always like cover stuff. And then, but writing original music forced me to be like, okay, what, what is my sound? You know? Mm -hmm. um, and so just, it, it's interesting because I'll, I'll hear myself talking on um, recordings my talking voice. I hate my talking voice. <laughs> <laughs> I, do <too. laughs> I do. I don't know. I just, uh, whatever. <laughs> it is it's the what worst it is. if I record interviews and then I listen back and transcribe them I'm like, Oh God. Yeah. I'm like, Brian, why don't you open your mouth? <laughs> yeah. Right. Stop mumbling. <laughs> <laughs> why don't you do this or that? Why do you sound like that? Yeah. Yeah. yeah um, but I mean, I guess basically it's just, I mean, call it bold, call it what you will, but it's just me being like, you know what, this is my voice. And, yeah. you know, I, I appreciate being able to get up here and do this and be authentic about it. And this is a hundred percent me without influence. So it's, it's a little bit like, especially I remember our first handful of shows, people ask me this sometimes too. They're like, do you still get nervous? And um, not to the level that I did at first where I was like, yeah. Oh my God. Oh my God. You know, it's like show day. Um, now it's more just like, heck yeah, let's go do this. You know, like let's, let's have fun. It's more like, mm -hmm. it's not like nerves. It's more like, let's go fucking rock, you know, let's yeah. go have fun. Yeah. Yeah. I did an open mic for the first time, like last summer for the first time in a long time. And it was, it was kind of unnerving, but it wasn't as bad as I thought it would be. Yeah. And once you, you know, maybe the first song or two, Mm -hmm. is you know like your your nerves are super high they're on like full throttle 
but then you're like your your body and your mind realize you're like I'm safe this is fine things are going well there's no technical difficulties mm-hmm. we're good we're good and you just kind of like naturally calm and ease into it I kind of feel like part of it's me just getting older and just not really giving a shit anymore <laughs> it's like yeah yes exactly like even if i sing badly and everyone's like oh fuck that guy it's like eh, who cares <laughs> <You know? laughs> and and honestly um i used to be a perfectionist an mm-hmm. absolute perfectionist um to the point where like i remember when we recorded three songs for rock 94 7 jeff actually jeff sambom uh told me he's like i've never heard a vocalist who because we did you know we laid one track and then he's like, let's layer, have you do, you know, you know, the exact same thing again. And he's like, mm-hmm. I've never heard a vocalist be so consistent where like, it's like you're singing the exact same thing oh, wow. and it, timing wise and everything um, that I'm a natural perfectionist, but over time I've learned like, you know what? I'm human too. Yeah. And I'm not on auto tune and I never will be auto tuned. So, Hey, I'm going to mess up sometimes, but life yeah. goes on. And I think, I think people appreciate every once in a while if you mess up because it's like, yeah, I'm a human too. Yeah. You know, I, I mess up. <laughs> I definitely mess up. Definitely. Well, the, the imperfections are, are kind of what make it too. You know, you can't. Yes, I agree. Sometimes those unexpected things, it's like, leave it, leave it as is. Cause it's, mm-hmm. you know, it's cool. Exactly. Yeah. 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 So are you guys planning to do some recording? We, um, yes. Ryan is actually getting in with Marty he actually just got back to us today or yesterday that um, he's like, but he's the type we always, you know, with when Nick got in there and Jeff got in there, we wanted to like come and hang out with Marty and it's, it's a blast. But Ryan is like, (laughs) he's, he's not that type. He's like, he doesn't want anyone in there when he's recording. So he just sent to us, he goes, just to let you know, the date's booked, but I'm not telling you what it is. (laughs) Let me know that it's there. It's going to (laughs) happen. So yeah, we're in the process right now. Um, gosh, how many songs do we have? So that's going to be a 10 song album. Um, and since then I want to say, are we up to 15 total now? Wow. Yeah. We're working on a brand new one. We, um, it's called hell in a hand basket. I really Mm -hmm. wanted it to be ready for new year's Eve because what better way to kiss 2020 goodbye than a song called hell in a hand basket. Yeah. yeah. (laughs) Talking about the end of the world. Um, but uh, it's it's in the works yet. Um, but yeah, we have that one. And then we have my one where I'm like, this one's an intense one. Maybe going to scream on it. Who knows? I have aspirations to learn in the next couple months. Just really, you know, take vocal rest, of course, because just like resting your body, resting your voice is, is just as important. But hammering on, hammering on it as much as I can in the next few months to hone in on technique and get it done. Well, well, I'll keep an eye on my phone. I'm ready to lay down some kazoo tracks. Okay. Yeah, do yeah. some kazoo. I'm a, I'm you know a experienced kazoo session player, so I'm ready to go. Mark my words. We will find a way to make it happen. We'll find a way to make it happen. <laughs> <laughs> yes. That's Teach awesome. Me. Ryan Kowalski. <laughs> <laughs> well, Melissa, we just talked for an hour and a half. Holy cow. I told you I had the gift of gap. Yeah, huh? <laughs> I felt like we could have talked more. Uh, it's great. Yeah. It great having you on. Uh, so where uh, should people follow you on Facebook or what did you Facebook. anything you want to promote? Yeah. Um, both personally and the band, we have Facebook and Instagram. Mm-hmm. Um, the band is on Instagram. They are the heartless band. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the my heartless personal is H-A-R-L- H-A-R-T. Yep. And that's, yeah. yeah, that's the thing. No, it's no it's, E in it. No first E. It's mm-hmm. it's misspelled so many times. Right. Um, I'm not mad about it. I'm just like, oh, you don't know any better. It's fine. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, just as my last name is spelled H A R T L E S S um, with a the in front of it. Um, oh. Our Instagram handle is the Heartless Band. My personal is Melissa dot Hartle um the heartless Mm -hmm. our facebook we currently have a picture of nick drumming um but it's like a big bright picture of uh all of us in the band um local artist chic uh i think it's kind of basically the way that he described it um was he said i 
he did each of our individual photos and he said the way that I did it and, and why I did it the way I did it was I looked at you while you're performing and basically this is what I saw while you perform. Um, and so I'm like, it's kind of like synesthesia in a way where those, you know, a synesthetic artist would abstract art, listen to a song and then just paint um, look up synesthesia art. It's mm-hmm. incredible. You know, every song has like, basically its own little story of color. It's really cool. Um, but yeah, so that's our cover photo, real bright kind of synesthesia sort of thing going on. Um, yeah. And I'm on Facebook as Melissa Ray Hartle as well. <laughs> Very cool. All right. Well, I have all my guests close out the show by saying, uh, keep it awesome. So keep it awesome, Melissa. Hey, and I have to say, thank you so much for having me and keep it awesome. Keep it awesome. All right. Bye, everyone. Thanks for listening.